morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and thank you very much for making it here on this slightly chilly morning. Uh, my name is Richard Lewis. I'm the convener for Code Transport from Edinburgh City Council. And it's a very great pleasure, to, as I say, to welcome you all to this, all this unveiling of the engraving uh, of uh, the great Gavin Douglas. Now, for myself, Gavin Douglas was a bit of a discovery this year, but a, a very welcome one. Um, as some of you may know, uh, we had recently the commemorations of the, of the infamous Battle of Flodden, which was one of the great defeats uh, in, in, in Scotland's uh, military history. Uh, but that was where the, the, the one of the name Gavin Douglas also first uh, emerged quite strongly. He was an extraordinary character, uh, highly evolved in machinations for the Archbishop Brick of St. Andrews, which he spent much of his life. And after the actual defeat in the battle itself, he became a very close confidant of James IV's widow and advising in courtly policy after the death of James IV. And he was also one of the, uh, inf the crucial figures in negotiating the Treaty of Rouen in 1517 with the French, which was renewed the old alliance uh, with uh, our great allies. So he was quite a character. Uh, if not that I think you can use this phrase, he was not simply uh, an author and poet, because that in itself is an extraordinary achievement, but you can see he packed an awful lot into what was an extraordinary lifetime. So I do all, urge all of you, if you're not aware of him, to, to really find out about both this extraordinary individual, but an extraordinary time in uh, Scotland and, of course, Edinburgh's history. One of the reasons for celebrating Gavin Douglas is the fact that it is the 500th anniversary of the completion of the Aeneidos. He has another earlier very great poem, very worth reading, although it's not on the scale of the Aeneidos, but it's an entirely original poem. It's a wonderfully rich poem called The Palace of Honour, and I do recommend that poem to you as well. That poem was dedicated to James IV, who was probably the most inspiring monarch Scotland ever had. He obviously had enormous personal charisma, and he made his kingdom feel as though it really was somewhere. He walked the European political stage with enormous confidence. And when you think how small and impoverished Scotland was, you could say the man's sheer brass neck was unbelievable, but he found the people around him to justify that in cultural terms that long, long, long outlive the catastrophe at Flodden. And the, perhaps the greatest of the achievements of James's reign are a mass by Robert Carver, not the one that's being sung in St. Giles tonight, but a ten-part mass, and the Aeneidos. This is where Scotland really seeks the heights. And in the piece commemorating the Battle of Flodden, that's going to be sung after the mass in Gavin Douglas's own uh, High Kirk of St. Giles tonight, there is a line in the Latin poem written the year before Flodden, that is, in 1512, Parca verbis sed alta cupid, speaking about the Scottish people. Few their words, yet they seek the heights. And in the Aeneidos, with rather more than a few words, Gavin Douglas really did seek and hit the heights, which is why we've decided to, the quotation that was decided on from the Aeneidos is not a translation of Virgil, it's original text by Gavin Douglas because he wrote original poems to preface each of the 13 books of the Aeneid. Because Gavin Douglas is not part of the past. The language he wrote in is still spoken by huge numbers of folk in Scotland, and it's the thing I expect for them at home. So um, I'm speaking English to make sure that it's a kind of common language, a lingua franca. Um, but the quotation that has been chosen celebrates the Scots language. And you'll see it when the flagstone is revealed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, and I think uh, I'm very lucky today because I'm surrounded by friends of the day and no critics. But I see a few translators in the audience today and they'll ken exactly the, 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 the challenges that Douglas faced in his own day. Anyway, I'll read this uh, short extract. Trials of a translator. Sinai defend and forbid us every wicht that can not spell their pater noster recht. For till corrector yet amend Virgil, or the translator blame in his vulgar style, I know what pain is to follow him foot hate, albeit thou think my song intricate. Traced will to follow in fixed sentence or meter is mere practic, difficile and mere straighter. 
Thought thine and Jane be elevate and he than for to write all ways at liberty. If I had no been to ain boundless constrain it of my bad wit, perchance I could have fain it in rhyme or ragmen twice as curious, but no be twenty parts say sententious. What is attach it until a stake we see may go ne furrer? But reel about that tree. Rich so am I to Virgilus text abound. I may not flee, lest than ain fault be found. For thought I would transcend and go beside his work remainest. My shame I cannot hide. And thus I am constrained, else ne'er I may, to have his verse and go the other way. Less some history, subtle word, or the rhyme, causes me mark digression sometime. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of the Battle of Flodden, there can be little doubt that 1513 was a tragic year for Scotland. But it was also a year of great academic and artistic achievement. The Aeneadot, completed 500 years ago this year, is seen as one of Scotland's finest contributions to European civilization. Gavin Douglas, provost of the High Kirk of St Giles and later Bishop of Dunkeld, can surely be considered one of the great Scots mackers. I am very proud indeed to be able to unveil this stone, celebrating his achievement. to, to um, make a short uh, toast to the day and to, to Gavin Douglas. I thought it was an absolutely splendid event this morning and uh, a real honour to have His Grace the Duke here to unveil the, the, the stone today in the court. Uh, and that stain sits, say, wheel with all the other stains to all the other great markers and writers in Scotland of the past and who knows of the future and mere to come, let's hope, you know, because there are still great writers in Scotland to this very day. Um, and, and, and this is a, a celebration of all the folk. Can you imagine kids in their skills no been talked or no been aware of who William Shakespeare was? And yet, here we have it today, Wayne's in Scotland who are not aware of Gavin Douglas, never, have never heard of Gavin Douglas, and it's a real, you know, to my mind, it's a, it's a real tragedy that mere of our young folk didn't ken were in history, were in literary history, um, of who a person like that was. And, and mere needs to be done, hopefully, to, to you know, he's up the name of Gavin Douglas and mark, mark for mere a war of Douglas and his writings. It's an incredibly important thing. So I think the toast should just be a uh, Gavin Douglas and Scotland. Gavin Douglas and Scotland. I think it's a wonderful event here today, I have to say, because Gavin Douglas is unfortunately a kind of hidden hero of Scottish poetry. I, he's not as well known as he ought to be. The Aeneid, what a fantastic subject that never loses its relevance, as you know. 
I mean, the whole the whole business in Scottish poetry of dealing with conflict, of dealing with war, it has to have its foundation, I think, uh, not only in the ballads, but also in Gavin Douglas's interpretation of the Aeneid. So I think it's uh, a marvelous way of bringing him, it sounds funny to say that a stone brings somebody to light, but it is a way of shining a light, however briefly, on Gavin Douglas in the hope that more people will pick that uh, mention up and go and explore for themselves the kind of riches he offers. Why have, why have you came along to this event today, Susan? Well, I just heard about it by accident because there was a, a reference in the Scotsman in a crossword to the fact that Gavin Douglas had... T it was a clue was that who translated the Aeneid into English. Ah, and my husband right. wrote to the Scotsman to say that Gavin Douglas translated it into Scots. And lo and behold, a letter came from Rosemary Burton to advertise Gavin Douglas's getting a flagstone. Right, so this was all kind of serendipitous. You didn't really know about that. It was pure chance. I didn't know about it. You can begin prizes for speaking Scots. Yes. You can win poetry prizes for reading Scots. You can be encouraged to, to, to study great works in Scots. But if you use that language in the playground or even in the, the skill you're, and the catching... You're told to speak proper. Aye, aye. So there's been a lot of suppression or marginalisation of Scots. Now Scots is officially part of the curriculum. Mm. Just just over the last few years it's in the curriculum for excellence. In, in specifically in relation to Gavin Douglas, what it strikes me is it's a wonderful coming together of two things. One that finally Scotland is acknowledging a great son who to be honest is somewhat languished in terms of uh, those in the know knew about him and knew about his wonderful influence and importance but perhaps I was one of the many people growing up in Scotland at a time where you know, Scottish literature really started with Robert Burns, and then there was, you know, you, you spent most of your time studying Keats and various other things, and that, and one of the great examples of that is Gavin Douglas. Well, for me, obviously, this is one of the central writers of my period, so this is really exciting to see him recognised on a wider stage. Because oh. usually I'm teaching older Scots writers like Douglas and like Dunbar and like Henderson to students who've not encountered them, even though they might have been through the Scottish school system. Mm. They're, they're vaguely aware there must have been somebody writing something, but they don't know who. And they're quite shocked when they find out that actually the most interesting writers in the British Isles in that particular period are writing in Scotland. So we've got Dunbar, we've got Douglas, you know, translating the Aeneid before there's anything like this quality in England. From my point of view, and I know it's a Saturn act, this sounds a bit odd, but it, it lifts the heart for me to introduce students to really good Scottish poetry because it, it sets them on a platform where they want to know more and they want to, that's where I'm taking to the poetry library as well. So that, that plaque was... Uh, in, uh, unveiled in the courtyard, I suddenly had one of these epiphanies and I thought, wouldn't it be nice, you know, 50 years' time, if the whole of this courtyard is covered in plaques commemorating Scottish writers, because as you said, we've got great Scottish writers today mm. who now have the confidence and, and the, to, to go and do it. And, uh, you know, so I'm delighted to be involved in that in my own way. The Aeneid of Virgil was the, the height of literature. There was nothing to touch it. And Gavin Douglas Kent, that his language and his country deserved to hear the Aeneidos in their own tongue. He wanted to bring the Licht of the Mediterranean, the Licht of ancient Rome, to his own country because his own country deserved it. Mm. And that's just six weeks of four flodden, he finishes screaming his translation. So that's for the reason I had this whole thing. 1513, Scotland's glory.